Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session of our Fall 2023 Series of Tuesday Times Roundtable, The Significance of Community Integration and Cultural Understanding. My name is Michelle Zaldivar, your Senior Program Coordinator here at the Office of Global Learning Initiatives. TTR is our flagship discussion series that brings together multiple perspectives on current global issues and trends. You can learn more about TTR, watch past recordings, or come back and reference this one at go.fiu.edu slash TTR. As we engage in today's session, we ask that everyone please use the mics. We've got some roaming mics that we'll have around the audience. Our lovely graduate assistants that you met at the landing will be roaming around with those. Uh, this is in order for everyone's voice and opinions and ideas to be captured on the recording. So please, we ask that we use the mics. If you haven't already, please take a moment to sign in. Medallion students, make sure to take a screenshot of that confirmation page of your sign-in for your points log. If you'd like to learn more about the opportunities at the Office of Global Learning Initiatives for undergraduate students especially, including our medallion program, Peace Corps Prep program, and fellowship programs, please check out our website, goglobal.fiu.edu slash students. You can also follow us on Instagram, highly recommended, at goglobalfiu, or come by our drop-in advisor hours. TTR is always grounded in some global issue and trend and always linked to an article where you can learn more. You can read this week's article at go.fiu.edu slash TTR1003. In addition, FIU provides anyone with an at FIU.edu email address a free digital subscription to the New York Times. So if you haven't already, you can activate your subscription at accessnyt.com. Our session today is a discussion with Executive Director Refugee Assistance of the Refugee Assistance Alliance, Jamie Everett, and Return Peace Corps volunteer and regional recruiter, Taylor Mager. Jamie Everett joined the Refugee Assistance Alliance, or RAA, in the summer of 2018, and is currently the Executive Director overseeing all refugee programming for Miami-Dade and Broward counties. RAA is a community-based nonprofit assisted, assisting forced migrants from across the globe to navigate their new lives here in South Florida, with the most recent arrivals from the countries of Afghanistan, Syria, Venezuela, Ukraine, and Guyana. Jamie had prior experience working with refugee women for the International Rescue Committee's Women Empowerment and Protection Program and serves on the board of directors for Set Her Free, a Ugandan nonprofit which rescues, shelters, and educates girls. In 2015, she circumnavigated the globe on a study abroad semester at Sea Ship with her husband and then six year old, quite quite an undertaking, I imagine, and 600 undergrads where she mentored students and led impact travel excursions in places like China, India, Myanmar, or Burma, and South Africa. Prior to that, Jamie lived in the Brazilian Amazon for several years where she worked with indigenous women to create micro enterprises for women's economic empowerment. She holds a BA from the University of Pittsburgh, an MA in theology where she studied uh, liberation and feminist theologies, and an MA in international administration from the University of Miami, where she studied poverty and development, human rights, and the nonprofit management. Taylor Major is our regional Peace Corps recruiter for universities and community organizations in the greater Miami and South Florida area. She, serves as a, she also serves as a Peace Corps volunteer in the agriculture sector, sector in Guatemala from 2018 to 2020, which means through lockdown, which also must have been quite an experience. Taylor is a graduate of the University of Iowa, where she holds a Bachelor of Science in Human Physiology and is currently pursuing her Master's in, uh, in, of Arts in International Administration from the University of Miami. She grew up in Naperville, Illinois, a suburb of the city of Chicago, and enjoys distance running and traveling. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Jamie and Taylor. All right, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Michelle, for that warm introduction. Thank you so much. Um, so the rundown of our session today, we are going to explain both of our organizations a bit. Uh, we'll also talk about how you can get involved towards the end, but also really dive into this um, concept of cultural integration and its importance, uh, both for us US Americans that go abroad and, and integrate into other communities and cultures, and then on the flip side, seeing uh, people from other countries or other cultures coming here and, and integrating into the United States uh, culture and traditions that we have. So. To get started, I will give a quick overview of the Peace Corps. It is a government agency. Um, you go to a different country ab abroad and do 27 months of volunteer service. So you do three months of pre-service training, 
which we'll talk about a lot later today because you do a lot of integration training during those first three months. And then you swear in as an official volunteer, and then you do Peace Corps for two years in a community working alongside community members to help them accomplish their goals. So we have six work sectors that you would go into um, during that full two-year service. So we have health, education, agriculture, environment, youth and development, and community economic development. Depending on what you're interested in or what you're passionate about or what you may have studied here at FIU, you, would go direct, you could go directly into a specific program and work for the two years there. Uh, for example, when I was in the agriculture sector, I worked alongside representatives of the Ministry of Agriculture to help them with the different trainings and activities that they were providing community groups. Things like how to create a home garden or a school garden, how to maintain the fruits and vegetables, harvest them, and use them in healthy recipes. A lot of these individuals already have and had these skills. They just were not retaining the information very well or really getting as much high yield or good quality yield. So the Ministry of Agriculture wanted some support with the trainings and thought that they needed a bit more effective trainings or more retention in the, the knowledge that they were transferring. So we were there to provide that support, um, co-mentoring, co-training, um, doing things like PACA, which is an acronym in the government. There's many acronyms, but <laughs> PACA stands for Participatory Analysis of Community Action. So working with those community groups, hearing from them, talking to them, having discussions, and holding different activities to hear what resources they already have in the community and what were their needs, um, not just among that group, but you know, community-wide as well, and how the projects that we brought there could support and, and help them um, as a whole community. Um, I also did some secondary projects. As a Peace Corps volunteer, you have the opportunity to do other activities in your community uh, if you see a community need. Uh, so I had multiple people ask me to do English classes because they knew I was la gringa de los Estados Unidos, so <laughs> she must know English, right? So they asked me to do some English classes. So myself and another volunteer in the area, we collaborated and provided English classes. And then our other secondary activity was Zumba. We had a lot of younger girls that were kind of our friends that we hung out with, and they were like, you know Zumba, you like to dance. We should do Zumba. And I was like, OK, I've never been a Zumba instructor, but I guess we'll give it a go. So uh, we would just memorize like YouTube videos and provided like those Zumba classes uh, once or twice a week, which was a lot of fun in a really great way uh, to meet more people, learn more about the community, another form of integration, right? Um, and what else? So Peace Corps is located um, all over the world. Uh, we are active in 57 countries, most recently opened back up in El Salvador. Uh, so we're located in Latin America, the Caribbean, Africa, Asia, uh, the Eastern European countries, and uh, Africa, I think I said that, sorry. <laughs> but if you are interested in going to a specific country and doing specific work, you can apply that way. Again, as you know, I am the recruiter of the area, so I can work with you to help you get into that specific program. Or you can apply generally. If you can't really decide, because there's so many great options, you can just send in an application um, and let the Peace Corps placement officers choose for you. Um, and again, it's a 27-month experience. You may live with a host family. I did. That was my favorite part of my Peace Corps experience. I think because it was the ultimate integration process and the best way to integrate, I learned so much from them, and they learned um, from me as well. The full cultural exchange uh, was quite amazing. And I will mention, to be eligible for Peace Corps, you do need to be a US citizen, and you must be 18 years or older. Being a, a, a graduate from FIU is great. Having an associate's or a bachelor's degree makes you a more competitive applicant. But having three to five years of relevant work or volunteer experience would make you competitive as well. So that's a quick overview, a lot of information. Also want to mention, if you have questions, please write them down or type them down. We're going to have um, ample amount of time towards the end to have a group discussion. So please take notes. Um, and, make, and take questions, we'll take questions later. So I'm gonna hand it over to Jamie. Thanks, Taylor. Um, yeah, so I'm Jamie. I'm the Executive Director of Refugee Assistance Alliance. And unlike the US government, we are a small, uh, community-based, grassroots nonprofit. Um, started out with zero dollars in the bank and saw a need in the community. 
and responded. So the need that we saw in the community in 2017 was refugee women who were isolated in their homes. Initially, it was meeting a couple Syrian families and learning from them that even though they had gone through the three months of government um, care with a caseworker, so it's a refugee resettlement agency and they have caseworkers that are like social workers and sometimes are social workers, they still were really isolated and upset and confused in how to maintain their day-to-day -day tasks, how to learn new things, how to integrate into the community, and how to make friends. So initially, it was just a small group of women who went to the homes of refugee women to try to teach them English. Because again, we have no money, we have no plan, we have nothing in the beginning. And then quickly, um, when you walk into a household and you're there you know, with your little English lesson, um, and you sit down, and what happens is, they pull out a big stack of mail, or they show you a bunch of stuff they've gotten as text, or they're very confused about what's happening with their kids. So you can imagine confusing mail. Everyone can figure out, oh, you know, you just won a million dollars, send this back. Okay, that's confusing. But an example of something that might be confusing with kids is a field trip form. So when you're coming from another country, you're in a completely different linguistic capacity, and you, what do you do? You go to Google or Microsoft uh, language translation app, and you put in field trip, and it translates a trip to the field. And these parents are trying to figure out why the school wants to take my child on a trip to the field and why that's gonna cost me $25, and they have to be on a bus for 45 minutes. So it's things like that that are very confusing, that even if you know how to get to Google Translate, unless you have a friend in the community who can tell you, oh, field trip is just a phrase we use for kids to go do educational activities away from the school grounds. How are they gonna figure that out, right? So from things like that was born this community-based nonprofit, and now we have multiple programs where we assist women, men, and children in English language ac acquisition, community navigation, employment, and a lot of other areas, um, education being one of them, too. Um, so that can be people getting GEDs, kids getting into enrichment programs, adults getting certificates to get better jobs, things like that. So it morphed from confused confusion at a kitchen table over something like a field trip form into a whole nonprofit. Um, at this stage, we have helped families from Asia, Africa, the Middle East, Central, and South America. We take clients from resettlement agencies based on their level of vulnerability. So we'll have a list of criteria for eligibility to be with our organization. But in, in order not to bore you, basically it just means they have a high level of needs. And they're struggling and they want more help. So we typically don't get a ton of Spanish-speaking or Haitian Creole-speaking families. Can anyone guess why? Why do we not have a ton of Spanish-speaking or Haitian Creole-speaking families? And you can't guess. Yes. Yes, that's exactly why. So here in Miami, if you speak Spanish, most nonprofits have their program in English and Spanish, right? Um, if you speak Haitian Creole, that's usually the third language that a nonprofit might have their programs in. So our families typically speak Arabic, Tigrinya, Dari, Pashtu, Farsi, Burmese, languages that are not represented in South Florida in communities that are not represented in South Florida. And they're having trouble integrating. We do have several Spanish-speaking families. Taylor is a volunteer with RAA. She also was an intern. And she's worked with a Spanish-speaking family and an Afghan family. Did they speak Dari or Pashtu? Pashtu. Pashtu. OK, so the even harder language to find yep. translators for. Um, so yeah, so we're going to talk a lot today about what it looks like to be culturally sensitive and integrate when you're going as an American into another country or when you're coming in. The populations are, of course, different because we work with refugees who I refer to as forced migrants. That's people who are fleeing war, persecution, and violence. Um, this isn't just any migrants. It's migrants that are under extreme duress. Um, in our case, it's migrants who have been invited to resettle into South Florida by the U.S. government. They, that's not a statement on anyone else coming in on another path. It's just we're a small organization and we have to have a cutoff somewhere. So our clients, our most recent clients are from Afghanistan. All of the Afghans who came to South Florida were at some point farmed into our nonprofit. A lot of Syrians um, out of, outside of 2015, they started coming here. Um, I don't know where I was going with that. 
But I just wanted to talk about how we're going to look at this. It's, it's kind of like two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. It's why cultural integration is important and we should be thoughtful about it, whether someone is coming in here or whether you're going there. And our populations are vulnerable, but typically the places the Peace Corps goes to are vulnerable populations in some sense also. Yes. Right? That's okay, correct. back to you, Taylor. Yes. So. Now we're going to focus a bit on the training aspect that both organizations provide as volunteers to kind of touch on this cultural sensitivity and this f factor or this topic of cultural integration. So with Peace Corps, like I mentioned, uh, we do three months of pre-service training. And it's funny, whenever people call me or talk to me about Peace Corps and they ask how long it is, they're like, it's so long. Like, I can't do two years. That's like so much of my life and I tell them you know you need two years honestly you need more than two years to like actually make an impact to really understand what's going on in your town like you know sometimes there are some organizations that go into a community they provide a service for maybe a week or a month and then they leave that's fine right because they maybe they do have good intentions but maybe th that might not have been the best solution and you need more than just a week you need more than just a month to really gain the respect gain um, the trust of the community really understand their language um, to understand what exactly the issues may be rather than just those surface level like when you first walk in to a community what you think is the problem then you realize the community starts talking to you and, and gets to know you and you get to know them and they might reveal something and you might find a pattern between multiple people, what an actual problem is that people don't really talk about unless you're friends with them or you're part of the host family and like they trust you because you've been welcomed in by their, host, their family members as well. So that's a lot of what we talk about during pre-service training. Um, like I said, it's, the, it's three months at the very beginning. You haven't become an official volunteer yet. Um, they make that very known at the very beginning. They're like, you're a Peace Corps trainee. <laughs> you can't call yourself a volunteer yet. Not until you finish the three months and then you swear in. They have the ambassador come and you get a certificate and everything. So the three months, um, you do cultural training. For me, when I was in Guatemala, we did 20 hours a week for 10 weeks of Spanish class. At the very beginning, um, they had us do a language test to get uh, a certain level. So I tested in at intermediate low, which I was kind of upset with because I took like seven years of school Spanish. So I thought I was gonna be so great at Spanish. But as you all probably know, book Spanish or any book language is a lot different than the actual language. <laughs> so uh, the 20 hours a week and 10 hours um, for 10 weeks helped a lot to gain those language skills. Plus I, plus I did live with a host family um, during training as well. All volunteers worldwide, no matter where you go, you stay with a host family um, during your pre-service training. Again, so that you can really get to know what, what are the social faux pas, what not to say, how to say things, what hand gestures might mean something different to that community or to that culture. Um, and the food, the religion, again. So everything is discussed at the very beginning. Plus, Peace Corps does provide its volunteers with a monthly living stipend. They set you up with a bank account. They set you up with a phone plan. The Peace Corps is funded by the State Department, so they're able to provide you with these resources so that when you're there, you can fully participate in cultural integration and those community development projects that your work partners want to work on. So this is a big piece that um, I thought is interesting um, when comparing Peace Corps training and Peace Corps resources compared to Refugee Assistance Alliance. Like Jamie mentioned, I was an intern. I don't know if you guys caught, but at the beginning, um, when Michelle was introducing us, they said Jamie got a master's degree in international administration from UM that's called the Maya degree. I'm pursuing the same degree, and through it you have to do an internship for a pro or a project of some sort. And um, I was the intern for Refugee Assistance Alliance, and I wrote my practicum paper on this topic, on the parallels of the two organizations, the parallels of community integration for people that are coming to the United States and integrating or settling here in the US, compared to us as Peace Corps volunteers going into the communities 
and integrating there and kind of providing a bit of criticism, right? Maybe, you know, refugees that come to the United States, they should provide, be provided more resources. Maybe they should be set up with a bank account and a phone plan and everything that us Peace Corps volunteers are provided when we go to these more vulnerable communities, as, as Jamie mentioned. So this concept of cultural integration and what, the, what these agencies are providing, I thought was very interesting. And again, I, I really wanted to mention um, what the pre-service training at the very beginning for Peace Corps volunteers looks like. Um, and now I'll turn it to Jamie to talk about uh, what they do for, for their volunteers during training. Um, yeah, so similarly, um, we also get told that our training is a lot. Why do we have them do so much? Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people in South Florida consider themselves bicultural just by living here. But show of hands if you are actually bicultural. And what I mean by that is not biracial, not bi ethnic, but you, you literally can live and function fully in at least two different cultures. Raise your hand. Okay. Can live and function fully. Okay. So to me, that is the different, the understanding is the difference between if you take a vacation to Spain or literally half of your family's from Spain, or you lived there for several years. Huge difference, right? So this idea that, you know, let's just, the typical American tourist that gets poo-pooed a lot, goes somewhere and then is like, oh my god, I love everybody from Spain, they're amazing, and like, I totally learned everything, and then they like, yeah, okay, because they were there for four days. That can be really irritating to someone who's actually from that culture and is like, I'm so glad you visited and had a great time, but you don't know Jack. So that is the same, reasoning behind the idea of our training being long too. Um, just a, a more fun way to put it. So when we have volunteers want to work with refugee families, we tell them that should they choose that program, they will be undergoing a more intensive training. If they just want to volunteer with kids at parties, help with events, help with gift drives, help with back to school stuff, that's cool, that's different, they need to sign some stuff. If they want to go to the home of a refugee family, because we believe in going to them, because them getting places is one of the biggest barriers, so to really know people and assist them, especially when they don't have cars or know the bus yet, you got to go to them. And we, we tell them you have to do multiple trainings. So they have to do a cross-cultural awareness training. They have to do a trauma-informed care training. They have to do um, a training with our language app, which is called Tarjimli. Does anyone speak Arabic in here? Okay, it means translate for me in Arabic. It's actually a nonprofit that came out of a Lebanese refugee camp um, called Tarjimli. And instead of what we were talking about before, how you put in a field trip and then the computer program translated, it translates it a trip to the field, Tarjimli is live people. It's a live interpreter who you're texting with or you're talking to on the phone and you can put your phone between you and the person you're talking to and go through the live interpreter. Why? Because language is culture and culture is language. And I say that as the wife of a linguistic anthropologist. You cannot just simply transliterate things and expect them to make sense. Even something as simple as a dishwasher. Mm -hmm. Is that a machine or is that a person who washes dishes? And then you're gonna have conversations with these families that you're getting to know, not just about how to go to the doctor, but how they feel uncomfortable with the male doctor and they only wanna tell you about how they want the female and in their culture this and this and this. That gets pretty intricate, inter intricate and that's not something for Google Translate. It's hard enough with a really good interpretation system to meet them where they're at and really feel like they're being listened to and understood. So we have a whole plan of training people to come in and work cross-culturally. Return Peace Corps volunteers are excellent volunteers for us because they're not surprised. They're actually kind of thankful that we're requiring that much and they're not surprised that it's not super simple to go into another culture. So for some of our volunteers who don't have a lot of bicultural experience, they'll go into another home, um, they'll get to know the family, they'll start working with them and then they'll come back to me or one of our client staff and they'll say, well I don't understand, like they're just not making a good decision about this or where they're sending their kids doesn't really make sense, like they want their kids to integrate but they're sending them to Islamic school and like I told them this is an A school and it's further away but it's better and like there's just a whole lot of cultural misunderstanding and it doesn't mean that the volunteer is wrong or the volunteer is right. What it means is that they're coming from really different perspectives. Sometimes it's the refugee trauma perspective of yes, I know that school's better, but I just made it here safely with my kids. 
so I'm going to keep them at the school that's five minutes away because their safety is paramount, not their education at this point. Sometimes it's just a real misunderstanding of the situation and you got to back up. Sometimes it's them trying to maintain their culture and the things that they value from their culture, like going to mosque, going to an Islamic school, while also integrating. It's really hard. Are any of you immigrants whose parents you saw like struggle to let you go integrate and become Americanized? Anybody? Yeah, this is hard for parents. It's hard for kids. Um, there's, there's a feeling of loss and a feeling of pride for most immigrants as they step from their culture into another one and try to maintain both. So we're trying to get across to our volunteers that maintaining both, maintaining your old culture and learning the new one, those are two things that are valuable in and of themselves. And there's a lot of things that might look like they butt heads. And it's also a lot of information. There's a lot of new information coming at our families, and it slows down their decision-making process. And then, not to mention, you know, they're confused because they can't remember how to get to work, or how you're supposed to take time off, or what are all those things on your paycheck? What does that mean? This money's going here, this money's going there. There are really practical things that are confusing, and then there are people that are coming into their lives saying, yeah, but you gotta do this. And without a relationship, and without understanding the barriers to cross-cultural integration, it's really hard for the families to feel seen and heard and then take advice and take baby steps for integrating at a pace that they're comfortable with. So I know we want to talk a little more about integration yeah. and relationships. And I know we also want to talk about Savior Complex. Which one do you want to go to now? Yeah, you kind of touched on how integration is not assimilation. Yes, you kind let's of talk about that. Talk, jumped yeah. on that a bit. and. Um, you have a great, I want you to share the, the color concept with everybody. Oh, so before you do that, I just want to say, you know, with Peace Corps, we do have three main goals that try to accomplish our mission of promoting world peace and friendship. Two out of the three goals are about intercultural exchange. So how can you bring yourself, your culture, your traditions of either growing up in the United States or living in the United States, sharing that with your host families, community members, or whoever you may interact with during your Peace Corps service so that they learn about you and about America or America through your lens or whatever that may be or whatever that may look like. And then on the flip side, how you can take, you know, the culture and the traditions and everything that you experienced as a Peace Corps volunteer in that town with that host family or whoever it may have been and bring that back to the United States and share that with your friends and family for those negative naysayers about communities or, you know, the, the negative things that you see on social media or in the news, these news outlets saying horrible things about Guatemala or horrible things about Mexico or hor horrible things about Guyana. Like these are all countries that Peace Corps is in. And you could be like the light that's shed on those countries, right? Because there's so much more than just that negative news story to these communities and, and their cultures. So that's, I think, the biggest part that really resonated for me as a Peace Corps volunteer and what I really focused on. Yes, the work, like those primary projects, you know, in the work sectors, those are important, very important. But I think what's most impactful, especially for US Americans or people that may not be bicultural or biracial or, or just, you know, US Americans, when they come back and have the experience of another culture, they're able to share with other people in the United States and with their families that may be um, closed-minded about how open and aware the world is. Um, so yeah, this concept of integration is not assimilation. Like we're expected to, you know, maintain, like you said already, maintain our culture, maintain who we are, but also celebrate and take in and, and accept the other cultures that we um, interact with. And to be that way back here in the United States, because we have so much diversity in the United States, as you all know already. I mean, Florida International is one of the most diverse universities in the nation. So just, again, this concept of being open-minded and, and accepting, I think is very important. So back yeah. to you. Okay. Um, so most of the... I'm just going to say a real broad statement that I think is true. Most of the world's countries are more homogenous than the United States. What do I mean by that? It's a blanket statement, but what do I mean? So South Korea is an example. Uh, the majority of South Koreans are from South Korea. They speak only one language, and they only have one identity. Yes, yes. Thank you. 
And what does it mean to be American? Just real quick, just in like one sentence. What, what's it mean to be American? Ooh, loaded, loaded question. <laughs> okay, it's a trick question because nobody can do that in one sentence, yeah. right? Because America is not homogenous. We are pluralist. We have people from all over. Probably most of us in this room think that diversity is beautiful and it's an amazing tapestry. And even when it's a challenge, it's the goal, right? But it means we have a lot of different definitions of what it means to be American. Well, most refugee families are coming in and they want to know what's the American way to do this? What's, what's it mean for me? How, how do Americans do this? How do Americans do that? Okay, and we can come up with some answers. Well, Americans typically do take out loans, and that's not actually considered problematic. It depends on rates, and like you really can't get ahead financially unless you take out a loan for your house or your car or your education, and that's not considered terrible. And in some countries, that's really not considered proper at all. And in some countries, it's haram, which is you know against religious, against their religion. So. We can answer some of those questions, okay, Americans bank like this, American school options are this. But when people say, what's the American way to do holidays? Okay, well, there's a lot of different American ways to do holidays. So our volunteers need to be armed with the knowledge of going in and presenting who they are, because there's nothing wrong with who they are, right? We, have, we had a great team of volunteers from Women of Temple Judea, and they wanted to know, can I, can I say I'm Jewish? Can I, what do I do about this? Can I say I'm gay and, my, and I'm married to my wife? And we're like, of course, you be you. You're going in, and they're like, yeah, but they're very conservative, and they're Muslim, and they're this and that. And we're like, OK, but they're resettling here in the United States, and you are a kind person. Lead with similarities. Follow with who you are and your differences and build relationships. That's how we do this. You are a part of America, and we're trying to show them the best that America has to offer, which is that people who don't, people who pray differently, look different, walk, talk, have different backgrounds, they all can be kind and welcoming. And so that gives the refugee family this feeling of, oh, okay. I can maintain the things that are important to me culturally, whether it's my hijab, or whether it's how I eat, or whether it's how I pray, um, whether it's how it's important to me that my kids always speak their native language. They can maintain those things and still be American. We want them to feel that way. So this type of cultural integration is important to get across to volunteers because sometimes people will use the term assimilation. And I'm not trying to word police anyone, but assimilation means the blue person becomes the red person. Right? So we've got the blue people. And then we've got the US that's, let's just say, we're like a bunch of different shades of red and purple. And I don't know, because we're not all red. And the idea isn't for the blue person to become the red person. The idea is for the blue person to meet a bunch of red people and some other bluish people that probably live here among the red people and maintain the part, the blueness that's important to them while learning about the redness. And then maybe eventually they'll look kind of purple, whatever, it's up to them. Everybody has different views about what degree and speed they want to assimilate into. And usually the next generation looks different and the next generation looks different. And that's okay and that's their choice. And it's not our job to go in and say, you must do this. It is our job as cultural guides and mentors to say, America values this. This might be a path to success. Education leads to this. This certificate allows you to be this. This one allows you to be this. So we're not saying anything goes free for all. We're pointing out this is what it takes to get to this point. If this is your goal, you're going to have to get an undergrad degree and then get the certificate and move into this. We're not saying you have to do that. We're just pointing out what it means here. And we're trying to be culturally sensitive guides. But it can get, it can get a little confusing. Do you have any examples from working with the Afghan family that maybe stick out a little bit about you were with them when they were very early in their time here? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, anything about their their level of integration that you can speak to? <laughs> sure. So yes, so the family that I worked with, um, they spoke mainly Pashto, which uh, Jamie mentioned. And they actually didn't really want to interact that much with the other Afghan families that, are part, that were part of a, um, RAA. 
which was interesting because, you know, you, when you're in a new place and it's foreign, you're not sure, you, you want to be surrounded by something that's familiar, like something that um, you feel comfortable around, like similar people, similar culture, similar language. Um, but the mother didn't want to. She was, <laughs> like, did not want to partake, not even in, like, some of the RAA activities. I'd be like, oh, come on, it's fun for the kids. Like, they got to go. <laughs> so I would kind of convince her that we should go and do it. But I think she really wanted to learn English. She really, and that was a big struggle, too, because the English classes that she signed up for, they were for Spanish speakers. So she told me, she's like, everybody speaks Spanish. <laughs> and I don't know what they're saying. And then the teacher ends up speaking Spanish. So then I'm not learning English. And she found that as a, um, a challenge for her children, too. When they were uh, enrolled in the school near their house, um, they mentioned that the kids were getting a little frustrated because all the kids were speaking Spanish to them. And then the, the Spanish-speaking kids would get kind of annoyed with them because they didn't know Spanish or English. They, they were just you know speaking Pashto. So definitely interesting um, with that concept of language. Um, langu like you said, I mean, language is, I think, the biggest factor whenever someone is really trying to successfully integrate mm -hmm. into a community. I actually, I'm glad you brought that up because this is one of the hardest things for refugees who don't speak Spanish is that they're coming to a place where they literally need to learn two languages. Most of the jobs that they are qualified for are in Spanish, and their life, the rest of their life is typically in English. And that is, have you ever moved anywhere and tried to learn a second language as an adult? Yeah. It's really it's hard. hard. Your brain isn't spongy like it is when you're a kid. It's tough. <laughs> I've done it. Um, and it makes you feel, you know, real humbled, let's say. <laughs> so they're coming here and they have to learn two languages. And like Taylor said, there are free language classes that people can go to in the community, but they are taught from a Spanish-speaking perspective, understandably, because 95% of the students in the room are from Spanish-speaking backgrounds. So those Spanish uh, examples, they all make sense. But imagine that you are a Syrian woman who is already working hard to get yourself to that class. You had to find daycare. You had to figure out a ride because your husband's working his two jobs. You've actually never taken a class from a man before because your particular view of Islam is that that's inappropriate. But you're like, OK, I'm just going to go try. And then you get to this room, and you're surrounded by a bunch of people, and maybe you're getting funny looks. And then the pre professor stands up and says, uh, Buenos dias. And, right, and you did all that work. So REA actually has our own ESL program. It took us a while to be able to fund that. It's online. Um, it requires tech skills. And for a while, we didn't think that would work. But then we realized teaching intermediate tech skills was just as important. That's its own language. And so we teach these intermediate, uh, beginner and intermediate tech skills, and um, which the woman you're talking about wasn't wasn't ready for. Right, right. And then we teach online in a very culturally sensitive way. If people want to go out in the community and go to class, we actually encourage them to do that because that is a better form of language learning. You're going to learn quicker when you're there with them in the same sense when you're living in a house with someone abroad. Mm -hmm. um, but not everyone's ready for that. And like I said, it's a very, very Spanish influenced environment. For sure. Yeah. So we're going to start taking questions soon. Yeah. But um, I guess save your complex. <laughs> oh, sorry. Start with that. You want me to? Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm sure you've all heard this term, um, savior complex or white savior, but that's very limiting. So American savior, savior complex. This idea that you know best and you have the answers to other people's lives and you can fix it. Um, and I will be honest and say I think most people who come into the spaces of um, community care and caring for others, whether it's as Peace Corps or nonprofit workers or teachers, there probably is a little bit of that including myself. And there's also a lot of empathy. That's usually the personalities that go into this. And that, that's OK. We can, t we can take these, these things that are part of our personality that aren't great, and we can recognize it and then squish it and, and be better. right? So this idea um, of a savior complex as it pertains to this work would be telling someone who's new to this culture OK, but you're not going to do it that way anymore, because that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. We're going to do it like this, mm. right? Another example of that would be I walk into the, the room, the living room of a new family, and I'm like, hi, I'm Jamie. I'm a feminist, and your daughters are going to go to school. 
right? Is that this, this is, you might agree with my concept, but that's not a good way to approach a family who's brand new and maybe their daughters weren't ever offered education in the past. And maybe they were from a country, a small village in Afghanistan where their daughters would be persecuted if they tried to obtain education. So you have to back up and realize that you don't have all the answers. Yes, we want boys and girls to have equal opportunities educationally here, and we are not going to compromise on that. That part is not the savior complex. The savior complex is coming in and saying, you need to do this now, and it needs to look exactly like this. No. So the way we approach it, because this is a very practical thing, is to say in the United States, every child, male or female, needs to be enrolled in school. If not, you will have a truancy officer knock on your door eventually, and you will be fined. Children have to be enrolled in school. And then we can talk about the why and the how and all of that later. And we can talk about college and things like that later as relationships develop, because people respond better in relationships. People are going to listen to your advice and they're going to take in your word when they've learned about you, they've seen pictures of your kids, your pets, your family, they trust you, and then they're going to listen to you more. And that is not something that happens overnight. That's why Peace Corps takes a long time to integrate relationally before any effort, any work, projects start happening. And that's why we tell our volunteers, yes, they need food stamps. Yes, they need to learn how to use the ATM. Yes, they need to learn how to use the bus. But please sit and have tea. Please go to the park. That is not a waste of time. Every minute you spend building a relationship is a beneficial thing for them to feel seen, heard, and accepted here. And it's also going to help with the goals of getting your kids in school, getting food stamps, understanding how to use your food stamps app. All of that is beneficial, even for the practical things. Yes. So the only thing I would add, I mean, Jamie definitely touched on it and touched on it really well, is with Peace Corps volunteers, I mean, we talk about Savior Complex a lot. You talk about it before you get to your country of service, you have onboarding trainings and they do like a, a preview. You talk about it once you're there in pre-service training. And then you talk about it throughout your, your service as well. Because obviously it could be easy to fall into the savior complex as a Peace Corps volunteer, right? I mean, you're going to a vulnerable community abroad. You're a U.S. American that may have resources um, to provide to that community, right? So one thing that Peace Corps did implement is that no volunteer can apply for a grant to do a project in their community until they've been there for six months. So Peace Corps is pretty much telling you, you're not going to just go there and think and say what you think needs to be done, kind of like what I mentioned a little bit earlier. We want you to take six months to really get to know that place and for them to really get to know you um, and use PACA, right, those PACA tools that I mentioned before, um, to really understand what's going on there. Um, and then we continue to talk about Savior Complex even while you're an employee with the agency. So I work for Peace Corps, right, I'm the recruiter, and we... Um, we have a training once a year, an annual training for our whole office. And we had um, two discussions, actually two sessions, where we talked about Savior Complex, Savior Complex um, for the volunteers when they're in the field, how to mitigate it or prevent it from happening as a volunteer, and then also how to respond uh, to people that have questions about it as well. Uh, so individuals like yourself who want to know. And I do get a lot of questions about that. Oh, when I'm there as a volunteer, will I be a white savior? And I said, I say no, but it's up to you. You need to make your Peace Corps experience as mindful and intentional as possible so you don't fall into that savior complex, right? Work alongside your community members. Get to know them. I mean, that's what it's all about, really fully integrating and being culturally sensitive and understanding what the resources and the needs are, like I've said a few times. Um, this is all w ways for us to prevent um, that white savior complex from coming out. And I think also another reason why Return Peace Corps volunteers are so great for RAA. So this is kind of a pitch for Peace Corps and RAA. If you haven't gotten the hint yet, 
<laughs> so please talk to me if you're interested in doing Peace Corps, and then you can take your Peace Corps experience and translate that into RAA work here in South Florida. Um, or the other way around, right? Yes. Isn't it a good prep? For yes, it okay. is a great prep for sure. Just plugging. Um, but yeah, we're going to take questions in a few minutes here, but I guess we'll make our final statements. Um, the main thing I, I definitely want to say is thank you. Thank you for coming to this session and being curious and interested in these topics. Um, I think they're very important, and these are the two main things, you know, cultural sensitivity and um, cultural integration were two main things that I took out of my Peace Corps experience. As you heard earlier, I was, I got a bachelor's degree in human physiology. I was pre-med. I, I didn't do anthropology or social work, but at, through my Peace Corps experience, I learned so much about people and the essence of people. Like I learned during my undergrad, you know, about the physical side of things, right? The human body, physiology, anatomy, how the body works, things of that nature. But actually learning about people and who they are and their languages, I think that's what really touched me and made me so much more interested in humanitarian work and just in understanding the world. So Peace Corps is an amazing experience if you already have these skills and you want to use them in a more impactful way, or if you want to unlock those skills and use them also in an impactful way. Um, so definitely want to say thank you again for your interest and for coming to the session. Thanks, Taylor. Um, yeah, I was thinking, by the way, as you were talking about um, learning about cultures before you introduce projects and tell them what to do, um, if you're interested in that topic specifically, there's a lot of critical text of U.S. programs, I'm not going to mention through who, in other nations that flopped because it was very much, we're going to come in and we're going to do this. We're going to build this well, and it's going to look like this. And there was no, we're going to do this sex education program, and it's going to look like this. And there was no time to get to know the community and how that would affect them, how it would be received by them. So that kind of stuff fails. Um, so it's not even a good use of time, even if you're like, I want to go be a savior. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention that I didn't is um, self-sufficiency. So we teach our volunteers that it's really important, and our staff, that it's really important to make clients self-sufficient. Um, this isn't meant to be cruel. This is meant to be kind. It might seem nice in the moment to just do everything for them, but if you don't teach them how to make their doctor's appointment and get to the doctor's appointment, they remain dependent on you always. So maybe you take them the first time, maybe you do it all for them. Then the next time they do half of it. Then the next time they do it and you're there to help them on the phone. Then the next time they go alone. So then when you step out of their lives, they are more independent and they are not reliant on you. The opposite of that is savior complex. That's what a savior complex produces, is somebody being reliant on you. And we always say in RAA that our goal is to work ourselves out of a job. <laughs> At the point when our clients no longer need us and they are just coming to the party for fun and to say hi, that is when I know we succeeded. Yeah? No questions. Yes. Questions? <laughs> Thank you. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for coming here and sharing both of your perspectives. It was really interesting to hear how both of you basically help the same um, problem, but with different solutions. Um, I'm an immigrant. I moved here in 2016, like August 9th, 2016. I remember that day oh. so vividly. It's <laughs> insane. And I thought I integrate it really well but then in retrospect like it took me probably me and my family like five years mm -hmm. to fully integrate and understand how America really works so my question is do you think it's harder for foreigners to integrate in the US or for Americans to integrate somewhere else and why do you think that mm. that's say? tough you should do it <laughs> <laughs> um hmm I don't know. I think it's hard both ways, right? Because in both situations, the family or the person is going into a completely different culture in a completely different place. Um, I guess I, I will say, you know, I was a volunteer with Peace Corps, so I did go to a different community for those two years, so I had that experience. But I've never had the experience of being a refugee, right? So these two experiences are completely different. I, co I totally understand that. Um, 
But I think it also depends on your circumstance. So someone going to a different community as a refugee compared to someone going to a different community as a Peace Corps volunteer, it's totally different. So for me, I think definitely a lot easier because I was getting so much support from Peace Corps. If there was ever an emergency, I could call them. If I ever wanted to talk to someone, I could call the office. There was so much support there. Um, and so many resources um, that if there was ever an issue, I had backup. Whereas for a refugee family, if they don't connect with an organization like RAA, who are they going to call? What benefits do they have? What resources do they have? They can't, you know, fall back on Peace Corps or like someone like Peace Corps, right? Um, so it's a lot harder. Um, and I guess that's I guess that's the main answer I have to your question. Is it depends on the situation. Um, I think if you have support, if you have maybe a friend or someone that's from that culture that can kind of give you some tips and tricks and advice before you go, I think that helps a bit too. Um, but I think it's equally as hard <laughs> to go from the US to somewhere else or the, from somewhere else to come to the US. There's a lot of loopholes and red tape that the US government puts up for people that are new to the country, so that is a big issue that I see as well. And then also your you know, economic status it plays a huge role into it. It's so hard to answer your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, would I say. mean, so yeah. to echo what you just said, <laughs> yeah. I think what we're kind of talking about is a bunch of different kinds of privileges. Yes. So do you have trauma privilege, meaning you're not coming here with trauma? Do you have financial privilege? Did you come here with a bank account with some money in it? Or are you yeah. starting from scratch? Are you fleeing war or persecution? Or did you plan? Mm -hmm. Planning is a privilege. Think about it in terms of natural disasters. If you can plan for a hurricane versus something that you're not able to plan for, like an earthquake, I mean, maybe you have some plans. But planning is a real privilege. And by the way, that's really hard for refugees because they're not getting in the car they don't have to drive to the aunt and uncle they don't have five hours away to stay in the guest bedroom that this fictitious aunt and uncle don't have. Right? So planning is a privilege, finances are a privilege, education is a privilege. I think um, what strikes me about your question is I think the American mentality mm -hmm. sometimes, if you've ever read the book The Ugly American, the American mentality might be that it's not hard. They've got it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so I think for Americans who travel abroad, especially to live in non-dominant cultures, so the difference between living and going to visit an indigenous culture versus the dominant culture, um, if they don't think they have it and they want to educate themselves and humble themselves, they're on the right track. If they think they've got it, we got some, some short-sightedness, yeah, I think. For sure. Good question. Thank you. If no one else has, yeah. um, have you ever met any families or any immigrants? Because obviously, refugees cannot go back to their country. My, my question is that they wanted to return home. They want. They found it too hard to to integrate or not integrate to like integrate, and they wanted to go back, and they eventually did go back. Yes, um, I think most of them are not. Um, there's a power dynamic when people like me who have the answers and the access to resources are sitting in their living rooms and listening to their story. So I always try to take that with a grain of salt. They might be telling me how thankful they are and how everything is okay when really it's not. And I have to always remember that. But the families, especially the women that I've gotten to know well over the years, when they've opened up and told me their story and their feelings, yes, they wanted to go back because there's all this stress from fleeing, you know, a, a civil war or whatever you're fleeing. Um, and there's all this stress, but then you're feeling like, oh, I'm here, I'm safe. This is the land of milk and honey. Everything's gonna be great. And then it's incredibly difficult to start your life over. It's incredibly different to learn a language, especially if you have low education skills and you've never actually tried to learn something that hard before. You, don't, you didn't even learn how to learn. It's just incredibly hard to have all this new information coming at you. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I think one of our, um, we, we hire former refugees on staff as client liaisons to meet our new families. 
because we think that's the kindest way to be a bridge to the new families. Because as nice as I am, I'm just a friendly alien, but if they've come from the similar situation, it's a lot more impactful. And um, one of them on our staff, I remember her telling me, I felt like I was living in silence. And I cried every night, and my husband said, I'm sorry we did this. How do we go back? And they are successful here now. And they will still tell you that that's how they felt. And they feel like they can't say it because they have to always be thankful. And they are thankful in many ways, but they're also really, really uh, despondent. And also, they're, they have savior, uh, not savior complex, um, what's it called? Words are hard. When you're the one who gets out, Thank you. Oh. <laughs> they have survivor guilt oh. because their entire family didn't get out, probably, and they did. So that's a big thing with refugees. And they're wondering how their family's doing. And if their family did get out, they went to Canada, Australia, Germany. They didn't come here because the US defines it family as the nuclear family. And most cultures don't. And so they feel like their family was broken apart. So they're the lucky ones. And it's still that hard. Good question. Did you want to add anything about that? I guess I have an opposite story. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the family that I worked with that I mentioned before, um, the wife, again, they actually moved to Nebraska. So they're not in South Florida anymore. Because it's so expensive here. They're expensive. They weren't making enough money. Yeah, the, the rent was just way too high. Um, their two little kids are so cute. They're doing great. Um, and. So there was one person on our team, our community sponsorship team, who also spoke Pashto, because she was also a refugee about 20 years ago. So she had um, that connection with the wife of that family. And you know, I'll check in, we'll, we'll check in as a group, maybe every two months. We used to check in a lot more often, but you know, time goes on. But <laughs> um, the most recent time that I got like an update from the family, said everything's going well, they bought a car, like the kids are doing pretty well, learning English, enjoying school. And the mother, because I always ask about the mother, because she was a character. She was very, very interesting, very fun too. <laughs> we loved her. Um, I said, so how's the mother doing? How's the wife doing? And she's like, she is ready to just get on with her life and do her own thing. She loves being in Nebraska. She is hoping to get her own job. Like she feels empowered, you know, and she, in the town that she grew up in and lived in in Afghanistan was kind of like off in a really, really rural part. And that's also kind of why they didn't interact with the other Afghan families, because they were already kind of not, I don't know, like out, the outside group, I guess. It's tribal. Yeah. It's a very tribal. small tribal culture, rural yeah. town. Um, so she felt like she was so limited, very traditional, right, in the town that she grew up in. Um, a lot of gender roles and norms were upheld, very strict. But in the US, you know, when we say, yeah, women have rights here. She, her eyes lit up. She's like, oh, okay, well, what can I do with my life, actually? So, I mean, it's not happening right now, but she's already thinking about, you know, once her English is a lot more proficient and she actually has her own job, she kind of wants to do her own thing, whether that's with or without her husband. She's so. very young, too. Yes. So very she's young. got time. She has potential, mm -hmm. for sure. So really excited for her. Yeah. <laughs> In that particular situation, we actually had to have a few, what do we call these, tough love talks yes. with the husband. <laughs> yes. um, and I think that, I think that the empowerment that the wife feels is in large part due to the excellent team of volunteers that she had. Um, it was Taylor, it was this Afghan American woman who was a real uh, loving bridge to the family and an example of what this woman could become, and a bunch of other Peace Corps volunteers who just really got it. Um, and I think, I think that went a long way to this being a success story. And then also, the husband trying a few things, and then I remember a very long conversation I had with him, um, and her, you know, him realizing, okay, this actually isn't how it's going to be, and her realizing, wow, I have rights and opportunities and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but all this comes through relationships and time. This isn't we're checking off boxes of do you have health care, do you have food stamps, do you know how to get to work. Those are relationship-based things that take a lot of time, which is really what we're saying 
We're saying that you need to learn, you need to humble yourself, you need to get to know the culture that you're interacting with, you need to have cultural exchange because without it, everything is just a practical task and it probably isn't gonna go super well. Oh, Thank sorry. You so, well, so it's too late? Okay. It is, it is 1.30, and I just want to respect everyone's time if you scheduled us in and you're trying to get to class because I know it's the middle of the day on Tuesday. Um, so if you do need to go, by all means, please very quietly go ahead and get your things. Thank you so much for joining us. But no one's kicking us out of the room. So if you guys want to hang out and you want to ask more questions and we can keep this still at the large group, that's totally okay. Um, I just want to give the opportunity for anyone that does need to leave to go ahead. And a quick shout out if you want to join us again for next week, we have a uh, TTR, continue same time, same place. Agents have changed on both sides of the prison fence, the letter exchange programs as intercultural learning. It's going to be a really insightful experience. Thank you so much. Hey, question. So I'm Filipino. Uh, the majority of workforces around the world have Filipinos working in them. For example, a large majority of US nurses are Filipino. And so you have a lot of Filipinos uh, integrating with different cultures. And we are very religious and traditional people. Have you ever encountered a scenario in which, uh, at a cultural value, a person does not relate uh, culturally at, a, at the value and morals level? They cannot cross a specific line. Have you encountered that, and how have you handled it? Have you? Um, you mean like a volunteer? Uh, well, so you, when you're working with refugees, for example, and they have a, a cultural value mm -hmm. that they're holding on to that is in direct contrast with cultures in the States, for example. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Um, LGBTQ issues yes. are a big one. Um, a lot of our families, so a lot of refugee sending countries are traditional. They're conservative, um, gender norms, um, everyone's binary um, in their culture. Of course, everyone's not. I'm just saying that the view is that everyone is, right? Um, and so we, you know, we have, we have staff that are not traditional. We have volunteers that are not traditional. We definitely have LGBTQ clients. You can get refugee status for LGBTQ persecution. We have a trans woman who is persecuted. So we have clients who also fall all over the spectrum. And among our staff, we joke a lot about this is real diversity. And real diversity is hard. Real diversity is not does your pamphlet have different shades of skin and hair colors. Mm -hmm. That is just for show. Real diversity is that your meeting takes a lot longer because everyone's voice is valued. Real diversity is that people deeply disagree on really important things. Um, the volunteers are upset. Clients feel unheard. We have very conservative staff and very progressive staff. And they have to make decisions on how we're carrying out our programming. It is real day in and day out, and it is not always easy. So. We have foci that help us not get too in the weeds when we want to do fun things. So food, music, kids stuff, art, things like that, you can usually find a way to make everybody feel happy, seen, heard, and respected. So when we have events, it'll, we're focusing on this food, and this table has this food, and this table has this food, and we're going to playlist is going to have a bunch of different stuff, and kids, all about kids. Everyone's happy when activities are kids and art and all of that. Um, but an example of something that we did where we thought it would fall into this category, we did a refugee fashion show just for fun at our recent um, World Refugee Day party. And we invited everyone to come um, celebrate their culture, wear whatever they want. You know, it wasn't, we didn't dictate what their culture looked like because everyone's made up of subcultures too, right? So how they present is different. But we had a couple new LGBTQ clients and the one client um, from a Caribbean country said, okay, well, how I would represent myself is booty shorts and wings. This was through an interpreter. And then, and she w said, um, isn't this gonna offend a bunch of your clients who are very traditional? And so we had to decide as a staff, how are we gonna answer that question and make this person feel accepted 
but also have them realize, yeah, there are gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of side eye in the crowd, but also not pigeonhole every single conservative person and not say, okay, everyone, all the, the Syrians or all the Afghans are gonna look, at, look down on you. No, that's not true at all. That's not true at all, and we don't wanna pigeonhole them either. So we just went back to the client and you know, after discussion and we said, we want you to be who you are. We want you to present how you want to. Um, we have no problem how you wanna present yourself. There are laws. You can't, you know, you have to wear certain things within laws. And there are a lot of people in the crowd who are gonna disagree and you might get some side eye. And we just want you to know, but you can do what you want. And then they made their decision. And they actually made the decision not to walk in the fashion show. And so we had to back up and think, okay, is this a great thing to do in the future? Maybe not. But this happens with something like that that might seem silly. And it happens with much more serious things too. And I, I think that is the world we live in when we value real diversity. Mm -hmm. And we have to just slow down and be thoughtful about how to deal with it in a way that makes everyone feel respected. I don't think there's any easy answer to that, if that makes sense. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it's a huge issue, even in the States. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Can we show them our, our websites? Yes. Oh, right. <laughs> but sure. if we can, just absolutely a warm oh. welcome. Thank you. This was absolutely fantastic. We appreciate you sharing. Thank you for everything. coming. Thank you for the questions. Um, so there are some goodies and some informational materials up here. If you guys are interested in grabbing some of those, by all means, feel free to come down to the front. Um, and again, nobody's kicking us out. So if you have any questions or you want to hang out and continue the conversation, you're more than welcome to. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, and hopefully we'll see you again next week. Yeah, so you got to drag it over to the right. You got it? Yeah, perfect. Good job, Taylor. <laughs> hey, hey, here's the website, Refugee Assistance. Can you, can you go to the volunteer with us section? Can you even see it? Is it this? Yeah, it'll be under there. A get involved. Get involved. Again. Yes, and then volunteer with us. This one? Yeah. I don't know if this is a good one to be there, but whatever. Yeah, if you guys.